It's Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020, and thank you for joining us for this archive of Teaching American History's first Documents in Detail webinar for 2020. The focus of tonight's program was Abraham Lincoln's 1861 Fragment on the Constitution and Union. Our moderator for tonight, standing in for Dr. John Moser, was Dr. Jason Stevens of Ashland University, and our panelists were Drs. Lucas Morell and Dr. Jason Jividen. Thanks again for joining us. My name is Jason Stevens, visiting assistant professor of history and political science at Ashland University and director of teacher programs at the Ashbrook Center. Welcome to another episode of Documents in Detail, teaching American history's webinar series in which we bring together thoughtful scholars to have a conversation about historically important documents. I encourage all of you joining us today uh, to participate in that conversation, be members of that that dialogue by submitting questions via the chat box. And we'll try to get as many of those as possible. Um, and just one note, when, when addressing a, a question in the chat box, make sure you, you address that to everyone in the room so that we can all see it. If you just send it to, right, to, to the host or to one person, um, we won't all sort of be on the same page. So please keep that in mind. Within the next week, you'll receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. The speeches, letters, and other writings that we're using for this year's webinars are all drawn from our, from our book, 54 American Documents. They're also available at the Ashbrook Center's extensive document database located at cah.org. The subject of today's program, the document we're going to be looking at in detail tonight, is Abraham Lincoln's Fragment on Constitution and Union. And to help us discuss that document are Dr. Lucas Morell, Professor of Politics and Head of the Politics Department at Washington and Lee University, and Dr. Jason Jividen, Associate Professor of Politics at St. Vincent College. Um, both of these fine gentlemen have, have taught in Ashland's Masters of Arts in American History um, program, our MAG graduate program for many years. Uh, they are both authors of stellar books on, on Abraham Lincoln. I've read them both, although, uh, Lucas, I think you have a second book on Lincoln just out. Yeah, it's gonna come out in, yeah, it's going to come out in June. I, in fact, just yesterday I got the proofs of it, so um, I'm in a good mood. <laughs> wonderful. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Thanks. That's wonderful. Thanks. Um, so why don't, we, uh, why don't we go ahead and get the conversation started, gentlemen? Um, looking at this document, um, you know, the first thing that, that strikes us may be um, how short it is. Um, it, it's, probably, it's not as long as a lot of the other documents we've looked at in this class uh, in, this, in this series of webinars, but in many ways, um, right, its depth is, is breathtaking, right? It goes, mm -hmm. it goes deeper into a subject um, perhaps than, than anything else that's, that we've encountered um, in this series or, right, in, in, or, or elsewhere. My first question, I guess, to, to open things up is, um, in your opinion, why is, why is this document so important? Well, I guess I'll jump in unless Jason, you're, yeah. you're chomping at the bit. Go ahead. Lucas, Lucas, I will defer to you. You have a new book coming out. So I want to. <laughs> uh, I, I sure hope I talked about this fragment in the book. In fact, I, I did for several pages. Um, I, I think first thing to say if, uh, uh, is that it's an odd uh, uh, document. Um, the reason why we call it a fragment is because Basler calls it a fragment. The Collected Works of Abraham Lincoln, hmm. instead of calling it a note, which is what it is, he calls it a fragment. And I think he calls it a fragment because it seems like it is continuing something from another page that we uh, somehow lost along the way. Uh, to begin, all this is not the result of accident. We don't have an antecedent, right? What's the this? You figure it out as you keep reading. So clearly Lincoln had written more, and Lincoln liked to do this. He liked to, to, to sort something out for himself. He liked to just jot something down on a piece of paper, and if he could write it out clearly for himself, that helped him bring order uh, to that wonderful, uh, brilliant, compatious mind of his. And so uh, he's got this little note that as far as we know, he never used any of the telling metaphors in any extant speeches that we have. I mean, we're going to talk about the apples of gold and 
pictures of silver and, you know, where does that come from? And, mm-hmm. and it is such a telling uh, metaphor and a connection that he's going to draw for us between uh, the Constitution, the Union, and the Declaration that it's, it's striking that Lincoln doesn't use that actual metaphor, and yet he still does make those connections as he's on his way to the presidency mm-hmm. for the first time, for his first inauguration, and in other speeches. So that, that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, what, what do you think, Jason? Do you want to fill out more of the context I, here? No, really, I'd echo all that. I, I'd also echo Jason's comment about the, the depth of such a short piece in the sense yeah. that we're prompted to think more deeply about something that Lincoln does, in fact, talk about elsewhere, but in different language. I think Lucas yeah. is right about this. We don't see this same metaphor used, to my knowledge, anywhere else, yet we do see, I think, the same principle, the same sort of reasoning peppered throughout, especially his speeches in the 1850s, Lincoln-Douglas yes. debate, speech on Dred Scott, a similar idea but expressed differently. And while the language is similar, it's certainly not identical. And, and so at least, especially from the point of view of teaching, of including something like, something like this in, in core documents, I love to use this piece precisely because it's short. For the same reason I like to use the Gettysburg Address as an instructor to sort of sit down as a group and work through this together, right? We can actually yes. read the thing together. We have enough time. And I think you're right. I, I struggle with calling it a fragment. Of course, the Basler, uh, the Basler papers are riddled with a few fragments. Um, yeah. Not always best understood that way. I really do think notes, and mm-hmm. I, I really like what Lucas said about part of what we're seeing. You know, this doesn't make it in any public mm-hmm. address. Doesn't even really make it in any into any correspondence that we know of. But what we see is Lincoln himself working through an idea, and we know Lincoln liked to do that, mm-hmm. especially through writing. And if mm-hmm. you see Lincoln, those bits and pieces and so-called fragments sometimes do wind up elsewhere. We actually get to see in action over time, if Basler's editing is right, Lincoln often working with certain turns of phrase or certain ideas um, that become some of the greatest pieces we've ever read. So I think this is part of that story. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, we have many so-called fragments or notes from Lincoln. And this, this was a habit I, I understand that Lincoln had of, of you know, maybe privately reflecting and writing down some of his thoughts, getting them in order, some of which then would make their way into some of Lincoln's speeches, others that may have been lost, and, and then still others that may have right, never, never found a place, but that we, that we still have. Um, and there's, there, is, there, is something, there is something to that. I know others have taken to calling these series of fragments maybe Lincoln's diary, <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know how accurate you guys think that is. I think there's a new book coming out on, on sort of that notion that since Lincoln never kept the diary, these fragments are the, the closest thing we have to sort of the, the part of an intimate Lincoln. Can yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a quick, quick comment on that. I hope it's not one of our friends who said that because <laughs> I'm now going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to push back a little bit. Uh, here's what I know about Lincoln, uh, uh, at least some of what I know about Lincoln after studying and teaching him for over 25 years is, A, if we ever found a Lincoln diary, we would know immediately that it is fraudulent. (laughs) Lincoln was not one to reveal himself in any truly personal and private way uh, to anyone. Um, He's been known, he's been described as the most shut-mouthed man I ever met. And these are from people who knew him. It's not that he didn't have any good friends like Joshua Speed or even his his longtime law, law partner, William Herndon. It's just that wasn't Lincoln's way. He didn't bear his soul uh, uh, to anyone. He would do what Reagan does when he wanted to keep people at arm's length. He would tell a story or tell a joke. But of course, these were never frivolous. They always had something, uh, a kernel or a, a, a gem, a seed of wisdom in there that, that pertained to something that was being discussed. But, but more seriously, the reason why I wouldn't consider these uh, kind of approximate, uh, an, an approximation of a diary is that these were never written solely for himself. These were eventually, as Jason pointed out, these eventually made their way into public. And so the stuff that goes into a diary, I mean, you do that really for yourself and maybe for posterity in some strange way. But mm. but it, it's never um, these are test runs for yeah. things that Lincoln is trying to formulate in a way clear, you know, short, almost monosyllabic in terms of the words used typically. Like even when he uses the word philosophical here. Where else does Lincoln ever use yeah. that word, philosophy mm. or philosophical? That's too highfalutin. Lincoln mm. wants to communicate with the public, mm. not that they are dumb or stupid, but they want things made plain, simple, readily understood. And Lincoln figured if he could make that understood to himself on paper, mm. that would help him become an effective speaker, orator, persuader. And for that reason, I would, I would shy away from saying mm-hmm. diary. It would, it, it, it would be... Um, 
Like if we went through all the fragments, and um, maybe this book will end up doing this, but if we went through all the fragments, we'd notice how many of them almost literally made their way into a speech. One of the most mm-hmm. famous ones is the meditation on a divine will, right? That one, he didn't put that title. Who put titles on notes? Nobody does, right? Unless you're really <laughs> anal compulsive, anal retentive. Uh, uh, what Lincoln did is somebody, he wrote this little scribbling that made its way into the, the second inaugural address, and somebody later titled it Meditation on the Divine Will. Uh, so these were almost all of them were meant for, not all of them, but almost all of them were meant for eventual public consumption when he got it just right. So I, I, would, I would shy away from referring mm-hmm. to it as a diary. You've convinced yeah. me, Jason. You have I was going to say, this. no, I, th- I think that's right. I'll, and I'll say just in preparation for this the other day, I decided, because you can go to the University of Michigan and word search Basler's nine volumes um, through uh, electronic sources. You can word search. And I searched the word philosophic and philosophical and only came back with three or four hits and nine volumes. And as I recall, wow. I'd have to look it up again. And as I recall, the first couple were pretty early. And if one were looking for a synonym, it just would have been theoretical or abstract. Yeah. You know, yeah. The philosophical point, the abstract point is, but in practice and particularity, this is what we mean. And so you do see um, this word used very rarely. And the fact that it is used here, I do think it's important, but it is, it is used rarely. Hmm. Um, I'd like to talk now, if we, um, if we could, about uh, something that was mentioned a little earlier regarding the, the context of this right. Yes. Now, being a fragment, it seems that the, the context is a, is a little questionable. I've seen the date associated with the fragments, uh, December 1860, January yeah, yeah. 1861. We're not quite sure. It's, right, we got that, that circa, that C there regarding the date. Um, what do we know about the, the context of this, uh, of this fragment? Is this taking place sometime between Lincoln's election in November and his inauguration in March? Or not what are, you, what are your guys' thoughts on that that's that's certainly how i understand it although lucas i'll let you take first stab on this because i know i know you know this well and maybe i'll chime oh, in and help okay out. well i was going to give yeah. you a first round of refusal on that one um uh we know that lincoln was in correspondence with alexander um stevens mm-hmm. uh, alexander stevens we usually remember as the vice president of the confederacy but we should quickly uh, recall to mind that Alexander Stevens was actually a colleague of Lincoln's in the one term that he served in Congress between 1847 and 1849, when they were both members of the same party. Alexander Stevens is from Georgia, Lincoln is from Illinois, and they are both in the House of Representatives. Lincoln only serves one term. Alexander Stevens gives a speech, and Lincoln writes to his law partner, William Herndon, and says that my eyes are not, are, are not yet dry or they're still wet. He actually, Stevens actually brought Lincoln to tears, at least Lincoln claims in this letter to Herndon, in a, in a speech that, uh, that Stevens uh, delivered. So Lincoln and him were, were at least close professional mm-hmm. friends at one point in time when they were both Whigs. We should also recall that Stevens, as late as November of, of 1860, after Lincoln is elected, Stevens gives a speech to the Georgia state legislature and argues against secession. He says, if we secede, we will be the ones at fault. He says, if we stay in the union, we will continue, even under this new president, we will continue to prosper. Our prosperity is linked to our union with the rest of the states of America. And so Stevens gives this very heartfelt, very principled defense of at least prudentially not seceding. He's not, he's not against it in principle, because obviously he becomes the VP later and actually becomes a very strident anti-American uh, uh, orator and, and, and uh, statesman with his most famous or infamous speech, the Cornerstone speech. Uh, but so the context is this correspondence that Stevens and Lincoln are having after Lincoln's election and before his first inauguration um, and I, I think it happens in late December. Um, Jason, why don't you chime in? And if I have anything to add, I will, uh, because there is a particular letter that I think is the origin yeah. of Lincoln mulling over this metaphor. Yeah, as, as I understand it, and again, Lucas knows more than I do, but as I understand it, there is this correspondence between, between Stevens and Lincoln, and Stevens is lamenting to Lincoln um, that this problem of disunion um, is, is at the fore, and that he says, really, it would be incumbent a duty upon a well-meaning incoming president 
um, to say a few words to help calm discord, and that a word fitly spoken would be like an apple of gold and a picture of silver. And he's using the language of Proverbs. And so we have really what I think is one pretty definite sort of um, response from Lincoln in correspondence, and perhaps this fragment is the beginnings of a second kind of response. It's something that might wind up in, in later in a, in a speech that never happened. The first response is, is very famous because it's a typical sort of Lincoln argument about with regard to the idea of slavery, and really I think it speaks to this philosophical cause that we're talking about. He says, well, um, you and I have been great friends. There's really not that much difference between you and I, Stevens, except for the fact that you think that slavery is right, and I think it's wrong, and there it lies the rub. Yeah. That's precisely the sort of argument he made all the way back in 1854, 1857, 1858. It's the real nut of the problem here behind the agitation and sort of um, discord that's coming in sectionalism with slavery expansion is a philosophical disagreement about the rightness or wrongness of slavery. And he says, we can try to make it more complicated than it is, but at the end of the day, that's what this is over. Is equality a first principle of American government or not? And if so, in what respect? Mm -hmm. So I think that letter really shows us the context behind this fragment because he's thinking through now in light of um, this challenge to natural equality. What exactly is it um, that's a question here? And, and I think that's why the fragment really begins with all this has a, a philosophical cause. The all this is everything that's led to this moment, everything that slavery expansion, abolitionism, and now, of course, secession and an impending war. All of this has deep roots, and it's, you know, this goes, this helps tie together a lot of different pieces, I think, all the way back to the 1850s with Lincoln. So that's how I understand the context, Lucas. I don't know if that speaks to... Yeah, I think that's well put. Let me, I'll, I'll add why I think it's uh, almost um, certain that, it, that, that Lincoln wrote this um, soon after he got a particular letter from Alexander Stevens, and I would point that to uh, January because Stevens writes Lincoln on December 30th, and you quoted from him already, where Stevens says a word fitly spoken. And here's the important part. By you now would be like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Why do I emphasize that by you, Lincoln, now? In other words, before Lincoln assumes office, okay, um, he thinks Lincoln needs to say something as president, uh, president-elect because James Buchanan is not just a lame duck president. He's a lame duck for four months, right? November, December, <clears throat> January, February. Lincoln, unlike now, when our presidents are inaugurated in January, they weren't inaugurated until the first week of March. So you've got this long period of time that historians have come to call secession winter. Why? Because states begin seceding starting with South Carolina on December 20th, 20, 22nd, thereabouts. Um, and, and then, you know, South Carolina doesn't wait for everybody to do it at once. They say, we're going to shoot the flag up the pole and see who salutes. They go ahead in December. And then January and February finds six other states following um, uh, South Carolina into the Confederacy, including Georgia, Alexander Stevens' home state. So, once Lincoln is elected, it's not just Stevens, but a bunch of people, especially in the North, are saying, Lincoln, you got to say something because Buchanan's done. And he's no fan of the abolitionists. He's actually blaming uh, the fracture on the abolitionists, and he's not going to be very helpful to us. You need to say something. Lincoln's short answer is, I'm not going to say anything because if you want to know what I believe, if you want to know what the Republican Party, it's in print. It's in English, people. What do you need? He says, if I say anything else, they will twist it to make it look like I'm changing my mind. I'll look weak. I'll look like a coward. I won't look like I'm standing up for the very things that we got voted into office for. So he, he keeps pretty tight-lipped, except when he starts actually traveling to the Capitol. And then he starts saying some things, especially about uh, the Declaration of Independence when he, when he travels through Pennsylvania, Independence Hall, etc. cetera. Uh, but he never uses this metaphor. So now let me circle back. Stevens joins a, a host of people saying, Lincoln, president-elect, calm things down because South Carolina essentially has started this ball. It's going to snowball. You've got to stop it. And Lincoln refuses to do so, do so. But what does he do? Word fitly spoken by you now. Lincoln goes like apples of gold and pictures of silver. I seem to recall where that's from. Proverbs 25, verse 11, a, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. You can see Lincoln mulling that around, and I believe that that's what gives rise to him scratching out on the nearest envelope or piece of paper. Uh, hmm, all this, you know, something that leads to all this is not the result of accident, and then he uses that metaphor. 
um, and, and start thinking about how the Constitution, how the, the Union of the American States, and how the Declaration of Independence, he brings the Declaration of Independence in and says somehow how these things fit together. And as I interpret it, instead of a word from Lincoln now, this fragment is Lincoln's response to Stevens, but not in the letter, just to himself. Lincoln says, you know what the nation needs? Not a word from me. It's a word that has already been spoken, and it has been spoken to the nation. We need to remember what our fathers, and everybody loves the fathers, right? Nobody hates the fathers. At least Stevens doesn't yet. He will in, in, in March, but he doesn't hate him yet. Is it March or February? Anyway, February. Um, Lincoln says, hey, the fathers said something. In fact, it was the Declaration of Independence. That said something to the nation. That's what this country needs now. Not a word fitly spoken by, by me. It was a word already spoken. Now, let me draw your attention to the actual fragment where he does this. Notice his emphasis. This is the third to the last paragraph. He says, and this is where he brings up the proverb, the assertion of that principle at that time, his emphasis, that time, not now, was the word fitly spoken, which has proved an apple of gold to us. So Lincoln to himself is responding to Stevens. The words from me? No, 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 no. Let's listen to Jefferson again. Let's listen to the Second Continental Congress. Let's listen to the fathers, the founding fathers. Let's mull over and remind ourselves why we exist as a country. What on earth could unite these diverse colonies? I think the answer is found in the Declaration of Independence. That's, that's my, my take on, on Lincoln not being the one to think of this metaphor, and Stevens responded to it. I think that's Basler's take, and I think he's mistaken there. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. I, I hadn't thought of that. That's really, really good. Um, we got a question from, a, from an audience participant now about how this, how this document was, was received by, by people, but my understanding is that Right, this was something Lincoln kept private until it was discovered. Do we know anything about right how how it was discovered and then um, made public? Do you know anything about that, Jason? Because I oh, do yeah. not. I just I don't either. It was, it was part of the you know what they found in his hat in his right. desk. <laughs> yeah. no, you know, right. that's, that's one of those stories about Lincoln that's actually true. He would yeah. use his hat. Just to things in his hat. Yeah. Yeah. Very practical guy, yeah. right? I'm not going to yeah. get home to a filing cabinet. Just shove it up there, and I'll know where it is when I need it. Uh, <laughs> okay. but, I agree and, with Lucas on this. Found I... by his secretaries after right. the fact. Mm. Right. Mm. And I think you know, it's a lot of checks that weren't cashed. They're in his desk. Mm. He's just got <laughs> got more on his mind apparently. I think that's true of a lot of fragments, right? When we start going through someone's papers, you find these these random pieces. I mean, after all, they published an entire book called The Will to Power by Friedrich Nietzsche that was based on stuff that didn't make the cutting room. It, made, it was on the cutting room floor. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's amazing what you can do with a bunch of fragments. Mm -hmm. And so Bachelor, I think, they eventually throw these in. But how and where to put them, sometimes it matters mm -hmm. even as we speak. Hmm. Good, good. Um, well, okay. Uh, since since we don't know since we don't know that, and we can't say, okay, how is this this received? Let's just walk. Can we walk through the arguments? Right, yeah, Jason, right why don't you take the lead there? Yeah, well, I mean, when I teach this, I do tend to focus a lot, as I said earlier, on just the first sentence, that all this is not the result of accident. It has a philosophic cause. And when I tend to think of what is, what is the principle, what's the apple of gold to which he's you know, speaking here, um, without the Constitution and Union, this principle somehow um, would not have attained um, the, the, the place that it has in sort of American political history, American political thinking. And for me, What's so interesting about this piece is that he phrases it in terms of liberty, but not expressly in terms of equality. And we tend to think of Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address, the equality principle, but I'm pretty sure that what he's speaking about here is equal liberty to all, right? Equal liberty in terms of equal rights, I think, rooted in the principles of the Declaration. So as I work through the argument, my understanding of it is this, that the, the Constitution and Union are really the prudential sort of practical institutional means by which we're trying to secure and better understand the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And that, that key principle for Lincoln seemed to always have been um, the natural equality of all men, that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, um, and that really, if speaking in the language of political philosophy, that no one has a right to rule 
over anyone else without that other's consent. There's not enough of a difference between any of us to suggest that there's some natural rank or natural mm-hmm. hierarchy so that Lucas is the natural master and I'm the natural slave or vice versa. Mm-hmm. So as I understand it, for Lincoln, it's that equality principle that gives rise to the, the principled arguments for self-government. In fact, once the southern slave interest becomes increasingly willing in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s to deny the principle of natural equality, you yourself mentioned earlier Lucas's cornerstone address, which says the founding was based on a misunderstanding of the equality of the races and the equality of natural rights. Right. You know, once the South begins to jettison that idea from their political theory, that they sort of rip the theoretical rug out from under limited government, governed by consent altogether. Because what, mm-hmm. what gave rise to our, our right to even form our own constitution, to form a union, it was that natural equality that says we can only be ruled with our consent. What gives you the right to, to tell me what to do and punish me for not doing it? Only my consent can give you that authority. And so mm-hmm. that seems to me to be what's beneath um, the Constitution and Union. That's really what the apple of gold is. And when expressed practically, that just means the liberty for all, as he says here, that clears the path for all, gives hope to all, and by consequence, enterprise and industry to all. I would say here's what's interesting is this doesn't go into a later speech. This actually, in some ways, there's a contemporaneous speech, which is going to be the message to Congress in special session just a few months later. But mm-hmm. even before that, his speech on the Dred Scott decision, when he talked about the equality principle, uses not identical but similar language. This idea of a sort of promise that's out there that gives hope to all that their natural rights will eventually yes. be respected. And that's so, a great connection. Yeah, we see this. We see this played around with. So, to me, the the apple of gold that's being protected is really the principle of natural equality. The Constitution both is made possible um, by that principle, or embracing that principle, but also is meant to secure that principle. It's a, it's a two-way street. And there's a sense in which the Declaration is always the sort of uh, point from which we understand not only the origins of the Constitution and Union, but also the purposes of the Constitution and Union. And so to, to discuss one, as many in the Southern slave ventures did, to suggest constitutional equality, constitutional rights, maybe even a pretended constitutional right to secession, um, right. to divorce that from the natural rights principles of the Declaration is to put the cart before the horse, I think, for Lincoln. And at least that's how I understand it. And so part of what he's counseling here and of course, I think later the, the, the cornerstone speech is the best sort of counterexample to this argument, um, mm-hmm. or the sort of principle he's already against, um, is really just that um, forgetting. And Lucas, you had mentioned you know, going back to the founding. This is something Lincoln had been saying all the way back to the 1850s. So we need to recapture or reclaim that understanding of the founders um, rather than trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater in light of this sectional tension. But anyway, that's how I tend to look at the argument. I think the connection to Dred Scott is a fantastic one. It, it's precisely that, that place where he says something similar about this path, hope, incentive, et cetera. Wisconsin agricultural speech in 1859 does something similar. So it's clearly not the case that, you know, that Stevens' letter you know, jars Lincoln into figuring out something new about the Declaration. He's like, no, 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 this is, yeah, I've talked about this before, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something different. And what I find so curious about this, uh, I mean, there's a number of, of, of things that are, that are peculiar and, and wonderful and glorious about this, this note. It, the fact that he doesn't quote the Declaration explicitly, when he does so all over the place, both before and after this fragment, why does he put liberty to all with those quotes around it? Um, my speculation is that Lincoln... He, he definitely means what you mean and uh, how you read it. It's about natural equality. It's the equality that the Declaration speaks of. But it's precisely because people are now reading the Declaration as if it doesn't apply to everyone, not just the defenders of slavery, but the people who claim that they're indifferent, like Stephen Douglas. We need to talk about him some. We'll hold off on that for a bit. Um, so when Lincoln puts liberty to all in quotes, I think that's his way of saying to himself, I'm translating or paraphrasing what the Declaration means when it says all men are created equal. Equal in what way? Um, He's wrestled out loud, especially during the debates about what does that mean? In what ways are we equal? In what ways are we not equal, right? Um, The Declaration goes on to say that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So Lincoln collapses all of those clauses. Again, this is a note to himself. He's not going to be a scribe and repeat word for word what the declaration is, but he says, I think I've got it. Three words will sum up equality, the natural God-given endowment of rights to everybody. Let's just say liberty to all. That, that captures for Lincoln 
the meaning of the equality proposition, as he'll call it in the Gettysburg Address, or he also calls it a self-evident truth elsewhere that same year. But I think that's Lincoln's way of, of reminding himself and also explicating. This is what the Declaration <laughs> means as the founders intended. It doesn't mean what Calhoun came to interpret it to mean. Yeah. It doesn't mean what Stephen Douglas believes it means. It only applies to white people. No, yeah. it mu- if, it doesn't apply, if it doesn't apply to everyone, it applies to no one. Yeah, just to piggyback on that really quickly, Jason, if I could. Yeah. Um, there's another document in 1856, I think, Lincoln gave a speech at a Republican banquet where he suggests that public opinion is really what rules the day, and anyone who can yeah. change public opinion so much can change government just that much. He was fond of arguments like that. And he said, up until just recently, and he's here talking about the Kansas-Nebraska Act, up until just recently, we all believed in the equality of all men. That was the, sort of the central proposition from which all of our politics radiated. And he says, we've begun to forget that. And, and what's interesting is he says, we are still talking about equality, but we're talking about equality of states rather than the equality of individuals. Mm-hmm. So the sl- Southern Slave Ventures is beginning to talk about the equality of states under the Constitution, both in terms yes. of qualification and ramping up towards secession. And so some of it's a matter of rhetoric. If we're going to talk about equality, we need to talk about natural equality. And maybe the way to do that is to avoid using the word quality altogether and talk about liberty for all. And I think this is right to point to things like the Wisconsin Agricultural Society. It's also a speech in New Haven, Connecticut, all in the middle to mid-1850s, where he's defending um, for white free laborers the system of free labor against slavery. In almost mm-hmm. every instance, he makes these same kinds of arguments. And I think you're right, Lucas. We're getting here maybe a a refined and condensed and sort of shorthand version of Lincoln calling back some of those arguments he's made before, and frankly, a pretty pithy fashion and a, a pretty eloquent fashion. Yeah. 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 Don't try this at home. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Without a net. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, just following along those same lines and, and, and seeing this this argument as it as it progresses through these various paragraphs, I want to go back maybe to the, the third to last paragraph that Lucas mentioned earlier that has the, the biblical reference to Proverbs, um, apples of gold and pictures of silver. How, how does that biblical reference help to make Lincoln's point about the relationship between the, the Constitution and the Declaration? Or what's, 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 the, what's, the, um, what's the usefulness of, of, that, of that metaphor? What is, it, how, what, is it, what is its purpose? What's it trying to help us to understand? You get to go what is the second Jason. Yeah, I mean, I've tried to, and I'm still thinking through it, Jason. I was thinking about it this evening, you know, coming in about the significance of that metaphor in particular. Mm-hmm. And in part, it, I think Lucas is right that there is kind of a smoking gun here to say, in part, it's a, it's a response to, to uh, Stephen. Um, I do think that Lincoln was fond of using biblical metaphors whenever possible. And I'm not saying that to downplay it. I'm not saying <laughs> right. to downplay it or to make yeah. light of it. Yeah. I think Lucas made a great point earlier that Lincoln is every uh, – much as he is anything, he is a rhetorician. In fact, I think one of the most gifted rhetoricians that American political thought and statesmanship has seen. And I, I do think it's a way in which he can use that language in a language with, his, with which his audience was familiar um, to make a point. And I, I think here the understanding of the apple of gold um, being rooted in and around the principles of the Declaration is, it, frankly, and not to sound silly, um, mm-hmm. it, it's got a certain ring to it. But thinking through what is it about that metaphor in particular and even I went back and went through Proverbs you know, 25 today, just trying to take a look and think about, um, is there anything particular about the, uh, that line? I'm still thinking about it. So I'd be curious what Jason or Lucas or anyone has to say about that language in particular. Um, I'm, not gonna, uh, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I'm not going to get into the fine points of uh, the book of Proverbs on this one. I'm just going to take it at face value, which is how Lincoln, um, I believe, thought uh, if he were to use this, an audience would take it. But again, this one... Because he doesn't use the, it's such a telling um, uh, metaphor and symbol for what he's trying to explain about the connection between the structures of government and their the, the reason for being, as Jason put it, the, you know, the, the purpose, you know, wh- why we have these forms. Um, uh, Lincoln, again, was, was, was looking, searching for something uh, to explain to himself, to gain clarity as a guy who is watching this country split apart and trying to figure out uh, what he would eventually say when he speaks officially in public on March 4th, 1861, where he does use that line about this is the only rub or, or, or the difference between us being, you know, you, you, you think it should be extended, slavery, and we think it should not be extended. Um, he repeats that almost verbatim in the first inaugural address, but he doesn't bring in the proverb. Um, uh, 
what, what, what's, what's important about this, this proverb, proverb? Let's just start with the obvious things. Um, it's not an apple of gold in a bowl of paper mache, right? <laughs> the, the, and I, I'm using bowl just so it's clear in our minds. When he says pictures, he doesn't mean what we mean. Uh, pictures isn't like the painting that has a frame around it. When he says pictures, he means the frame. Um, the, the Hebrew in that proverb and just how pictures is understood is a setting. But it's a valuable setting, okay? So everybody at the time would say they were for union. The problem is well, the union to accomplish what? That's the difficulty. But what Lincoln is trying to show here is, um, he, yes, he takes down the union and the constitution of Peg by making them silver. But he does so to say, yes, constitution, super valuable. Union, really valuable. Silver. Ah, what? Is there something more valuable than silver? Yes, gold. The gold apples are meant to be set off. That's why you have these, these pictures of silver, this bowl, this setting, this frame. And so he's trying to understand for himself how these things relate, and they are not equal. That's the point. There is a hierarchy yeah. here. Right. One is means to a higher end, and the end are these apples. We want these apples to look beautiful, and so we put them in something really nice. Not gold. They're silver. And what's happened is, and, and I don't know when you want to talk about this, uh, Jason, but when he talks about blurred, bruised, or broken, we need to, we need to figure out, well, hmm, in December, January of 1860, 61, what is blurring? What is blurring the gold? What, what's mm. making it hard to see these super cool golden apples? What's bruising the apples? Mm. And, and the worst, right? What, is, what could possibly break? This beautiful ornamented thing, this, these apples of gold and pictures of silver, what's, what's out there that's breaking? And so what Lincoln is doing is essentially, he's already won the election, mm. but he for himself is trying to lay out for himself, these were the reigning alternatives of the day. And al his alternative, the Republican understanding of the Declaration and its relation to the Constitution, you've got what uh, Stephen Douglas is in doing with the Constitution, and then you've got what the sons of Calhoun, since Calhoun's dead, James mm -hmm. Henry Hammond, Thornwell, all those mm -hmm. guys, basically all the Southern Deep South, we have their understanding of the Constitution and where are the apples in that. Um, if we can disentangle that, I think that would be, um, be, be also very <clears throat> telling. No, I, I think that's exactly right. There's, uh, from the 1830s really forward, um, there is this, we're gonna think about the Constitution's relation to the Declaration. There had been on the part of folks both in the South, but also even in the abolitionist North to argue that the framers constitution was in fact a pro-slavery constitution. Yes. Um, you see this in people like William Lloyd Garrison just as much as you see it in people like yeah. Johnson Calhoun. Good, and so Lincoln good has seen this for a long time and this sort of forgetting of the, the fact that the, the toleration or compromises with slavery in the constitution were just that, they were compromises that stood in contradiction to the principles beneath it. So you had to find some way to distinguish its first principles from its compromises. And the only way to do that is through the lens of the Declaration. And so through this either forgetting or perhaps reinterpretation of the Declaration, all like someone mm -hmm. like Calhoun, um, you get, I think, that bruising and that hopefully, God forbid, but potential breaking, right, of this understanding of the apple. Um, I don't think it's something that starts with the Civil War. It predates the Civil War. Of course, it, it goes all the way back to a more aggressive slave interest from the 1830s forward. Um, and mm -hmm. Lincoln was always fond of suggesting that our policy in the Republican Party is to place slavery back on the path in which it was intended by the founding, which is on the course of ultimate distinction. And part of the question of slavery expansion for the last 15 years here had been an increasing willingness to sort of trim at the margins and to suggest, well, through compromise, but every once in a while there's this forgetting, well, the ultimate end is the path of ultimate extinction, not merely a toleration. Yes. Um, to prevent civil uh, discord. And so I think that's part of what Lincoln has in mind is slowly but surely that apple was perhaps being bruised because of this forgetting and this new aggressive policy footing of slavery that had been going on for, for a while. Yeah, let me add something and, and, and interrupt me, Jason, if there's a, a burning question that uh, either of the Jasons, a burning question that someone in the chat has proposed because we, we do want to bring in their, their, their input here, especially questions that they might have. But I have to say, uh, or, or I want to say that 
Um, Lincoln isn't the only one claiming the mantle of the founders. Uh, as, as Jason pointed out, Alexander Stevens will come to reject the founders and very explicitly in his cornerstone speech in, in, in just a couple of months uh, after this. Uh, but Lincoln is actually competing with other people who have a different interpretation of the, of the founders and of the purposes of the Constitution. And his primary um, rival in terms of claiming the mantle of the founders for himself is Stephen Douglas. And, he's, and it's not his primary rival simply because he's the leading Democrat throughout the 50s. Um, it's his lead, the leading rival precisely because Douglas interprets the declaration differently. He says, I'm the proper heir of the founders. I know our history. I revere and respect the fathers. They love using the word the fathers, very biblical. Um, and it's Douglas, not Hammond, not Yancey, not mm -hmm. the South Carolinians. Lincoln thinks in, the, in 1860, the, the front burner question isn't whether slavery is going to exist. We can't touch it federally, according to the Constitution, if it already exists in the states. The front burner question is, are we going to let it expand where it doesn't already exist and is not already banned, like in the states? The hot burner, front burner question is the territories. And that's why he says, and he uses the word insidious. Mm. He says, this is what makes Stephen Douglas a free state senator from Illinois. This is what makes Douglas insidious. His policy of popular sovereignty, which teaches white people of the North, not the South. They've already determined the status of slavery there. He says it is teaching white people of the North not to be in favor of slavery. It's to become indifferent because the enslavement is of people who don't look like us. You shouldn't worry in Illinois what happens to black people in Kansas, Oregon, California, for, for crying out loud, uh, or, or, or Nebraska. Let them decide it. We've decided for ourselves. Those crazy people in New York let black people vote if they have 250 bucks in the bank. Down in the South or just right there in Kentucky, they enslave black people. We don't go to any of those extremes. They aren't enslaved here, but we certainly don't let them vote. He's telling, he's trying to persuade white northerners to become indifferent about the spread of slavery. And it's easy to do so, and this is what makes it insidious, is because they don't look like them. It's yeah. happening to this race of people. And Lincoln thinks, oh my goodness, don't you realize what Douglas is doing? If he succeeds, moral indifference not a positive affirmation of slavery will actually produce the nationalization of slavery. That's what's so insidious about it. And that's why for him, the enemy is Douglas, not any slave owner, not anybody apologizing, you know, an apologist or defender, an outright defender of slavery. Hmm. Well, that's really well said. And I mean, you know, talking about how this, the, the apple can, or picture can be blurred or bruised or broken, Right. And hearing, hearing you two discuss this, it, it reminds me of what Lincoln was, um, what he said in the, the, the debates with Douglas, about what Douglas was really up to with his doctrine of popular sovereignty, about blowing out the moral lights around us and going yeah. back to the era of the revolution and, and um, um, muzzling the cannon that thunders its annual joyous return. I mean, that, that, yeah. is, that is blurring and bruising and, and breaking that apple. Yep. Yeah, I, I would just chime in quickly and say I think that's where you see a real kinship between this fragment and Lincoln's arguments in the debates with Douglas, because simply part of what he's suggesting there is Lincoln uh, is suggesting that Douglas is championing the idea of majority rule in, in the form of his so-called popular sovereignty, mm -hmm. is not based on any notion of natural rights, any notion of natural equality. And says, what is it do you think gives a majority the right to consent to anything in the first place? It's this natural equality of human beings. And so if, if you're your doctrine of majority rule is based on anything other than that. It's really just based on called power or yes. right. And that's, that's, I think that's part of what he really draws out of this supposedly modern or moderate sort of um, uh, middle road argument that Douglas is trying to portray is really this, uh, despite its appearances, might be one of the worst possible arguments we could make for, for free government. That is so spot on, uh, this idea that uh, that true democracy uh, true Republican self-government can become what our great teacher Harry Jaffa called crude majoritarianism. It is really the argument of numerical might, as Jason put it, determining what's right. 
If we go back to the fragment, look at the paragraph, how it ends above the one we were just t- talking about, the, is it the second paragraph. Mm-hmm. He says, no oppressed people will fight and endure as our fathers did. And here's the kicker. Without the promise of something better than a mere change of masters. Lincoln isn't just, this isn't a throwaway line for Lincoln. Lincoln has encapsulated world history in that statement by pointing out Americans were not the first people to rebel. We weren't the first revolution. Woo, we're the first. No, we were the first ones to do it on a principle of right. All other revolutions, sure, the people revolting were aggrieved in some form or fashion. They were oppressed in some form or fashion, no doubt. But when they became the rulers, what happened? You replaced one set of masters, one set of lords, with another set of masters, another set of lords. The revolters, the rebellers, if successful, they never instituted a new way of legitimating their government besides what? Sheer political power. Pressure politics, as we call it today. So when Lincoln says, but, you know, be, we, we, surely they were thinking they were fighting for something better than a mere change of masters. That's what he's getting at there. He's saying there was something truly new in the American Revolution, and not just new, something better, and so much better that Lincoln constantly referred to the American experiment in self-government in a philanthropic way. And I mean that literally. In other words, he says, if we succeed, the world will have hope of a different way, a better way of living. American, uh, Americans, if you, if, if you do your job well, you will point the way, uh, you will light the way for other peoples throughout the globe to adopt the same principles, some form of prudential structures to, in, in, to carry out those principles. Uh, this is what was so glorious about America, is that we found something that we thought would work, not just for Americans, but for everybody. Short of that, Politics simply replaces, the, it's, it, it simply reinstitutes the law of the jungle. Whoever has the, the, the might gets to dictate what's right. Lincoln said, surely we did something and fought for something better than that. Wow, oh, that's, that's, that's really interesting. That's, that's great. I am, hearing, hearing this conversation between you two, you two developed her, this is, um, it's, it's got to me thinking about the first time that I encountered this document in college with Peter Tram, um, uh-huh. reading this reading this out loud in class with him, and sort of just having you know my mind blown going through it, having read it one time and not understanding anything. But you, you spend time with the text and talk about it with others. Sort of the more that is revealed to you. Right? So we start this conversation off noting about the right the use of the the strange Lincoln word, at least strange for Lincoln, the philosophical. At the, right. beginning. at the end, he's very focused on on action, right? We the second to yes. last sentence we we looked at. So let us act, that either picture or apple shall ever be blurred or bruised or broken. And then the final sentence, which I don't think we've said anything about, and maybe we can no. say a little bit about that. We may so act, we must study and understand the points of danger. My question there is about right the points of danger that Lincoln has in mind. Right now, understanding the context. It seems to me, and you guys correct me if I'm if I go off track here, but it seems to me that at Lincoln, standing where he is, um, and the country standing where it is at this time, has several options before him. He can say to the he can say to the uh, um, the South, "Fine, we will join with you in calling slavery right and calling for it to be extended, and we will give up calling slavery wrong and calling for its restriction." We do that. Um, we save the union, but we lose the apple. We save the the frame. Mm-hmm. We save the picture of silver, but we've lost that apple of gold. Mm-hmm. The other option, he could say, "Fine, let the erring sisters go. You want to secede? You know, let them." This is sort of the Garrisonian argument. Um, you do that. You save. You preserve the golden apple, but then you lose the union. You lose the frame. But to do both, to save the union and preserve the apple, would require Lincoln to do exactly what he did or what he laid out for the country in the the first inaugural. Mm -hmm. To not give up on the union, to not give up on the apple, required the path that Lincoln then sort of led the country down over the next four years of civil war. 
is mm-hmm. that what maybe is going on here at the, at the end in regards to the point of danger, or um, what, what, what's your opinion? I, I think there's a few things here that I, that I try to think about. I think all that's very well said, Jason, although I would wonder, too, it's always been interesting to me that he, he doesn't say that the frame of silver is the Constitution solely. It's the Constitution and the Union. And the Union. Yes. And so I, yes. I think there one could wonder, because Lincoln would speak to this in a few different ways at different points, that would the apple of gold truly be fully preserved without Union? It might be that Union is also necessary to really be able to secure a regime capable of, of the institutions necessary to preserve the apple. And so one of the arguments is, well, we can let the South go. But um, you can pretty much kiss any chance goodbye of emancipation at that point because you're no longer um, in the same sovereign territory, right? There's all sorts of arguments. So one wonders if union isn't part of what's necessary to secure the apple, not even just the Constitution alone. But I wonder, too, when thinking about – I'm so interested in the line, we must study, because you're right. There's the focus now on acting, um, Mm -hmm. but we have to act, but we also must study, and it seems to me some of the points of danger – um, are very much moral and theoretical. It's this same forgetting of natural equality mm-hmm. as this bedrock principle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a word fitly spoken. I mean, mm-hmm. a word, the word. Right. Um, and if we go back and look at Proverbs, I mean, what is it? I think it's something along the lines of um, a word fitly spoken uh, in a frame of silver uh, is altogether the same as a righteous ruling or something like that. There's mm-hmm. this idea of judgment mm-hmm. and the idea of the right in that passage. And I wonder if that's in some ways, thinking and studying here, there's still, it comes back around, while it mentions action, I think it does come back around mm-hmm. potentially to the idea of a philosophical cause. I think the two mm-hmm. are, at mm-hmm. this point, bound together. And that's really where statesmanship lies, right, is where mm-hmm. both theory and action are, are brought together in a real mm-hmm. tangible way. Yeah, that's a so great that's point. Um, that Statesmanship is not something that one expects of um, the citizenry is at large on Moss. It is the work of, of individual, mm-hmm. it's individual work. It's a work of individuals. Presumably it's the work of the leaders of political parties, the most mm-hmm. you know, effective way of organizing um, uh, you know, practical outcomes uh, that are the result of the deliberation of the many. Uh, and so I, I, li- I like, Jason, this idea that, that uh, we, need, we can't forget the union part. It's easy to think of Constitution and Declaration, Constitution and Declaration. Mm-hmm. Um, my book has a chapter on the Constitution, and I fold in union with that, and then a chapter on the Declaration. Um, but the abolitionists, I, I, I think we, we really need to press in with these guys. They think they will preserve the apple of gold without union and without the Constitution. In other words, that the Constitution is not worth fighting for. Um, we have to remember <laughs> what Lincoln thinks is at stake is not just emancipation, it's self-government. It's, it, it's the, very, the, the, the very, the stuff of self-government. If we allow the precedent that you could participate in an election that nobody claims is fraudulent, uh, let's leave aside the fact that Lincoln's name didn't appear on, uh, on 11, <laughs> uh, the ballots in the 11 Southern states, mm-hmm. there's a reason for that. Nobody would rear their Republican head down there or else you wouldn't have it for long. But leaving that aside, Nobody's doubting that it was a legitimate election, but you cannot have self-government when the losers don't obey. And the example I've been really harping on um, of late, the last few years, and I've been teaching Lincoln for a long time, the last few years, I am taken more and more with the example of the Republicans in 1856. They did something that was so mundane, but so profound that we miss it and don't understand how bad secession is as a result. In 1856, when the Republicans ran for the first time nationally, didn't do too shabbily, actually. Um, A few couple, two or three more northern states, and and Fremont would have been um, uh, president. When they lost, they didn't say, fine, we're going to take our marbles and go home. They understood that in a republic, that you have to, a, a republic has to have good winners and good losers and it's incumbent upon the good looters, losers to obey, and if they really think that they have the right way and the best way and can gain consent for it, their job is to work to shape public opinion, which is precisely what the Republican Party did. In the next two years, they gained even more seats in the House and the Senate, and then come 1860, lo and behold, what does Lincoln do? The Republicans run the table, and they get enough electoral votes handily not in the popular election, but handily in the Electoral College to win. What should the Democrats have done? The Douglas Democrats, uh, Democrats obeyed. They complained, but they didn't say, not my president, right? They, didn't, they weren't championing resistance. The Breckinridge 
Democrats, the Southern Democrats, there's no other way to put this. They were un-American in seceding. They were un-American because they rejected a fundamental premise of self-government, which is if you play by the rules, you've got to stick with the game. You can't bail out midstream. It's not heads I win, tails you lose. When they lost, a good American would have said, great, you gave us a good run there. All right, give us two more years. Give us four more years. We'll, let, we'll persuade people that, that we are in the right. And if you're going to push back and say, well, what if they were really oppressed? Ha, it's not secession that's avail- available to you. What's available to you? And you don't need a constitution for this. Revolution. Revolution. And Lincoln actually, I mean, this is how bad things are. In the first inaugural, Lincoln as the inaugural president, as the inaugurated president, actually has to talk about the right of revolution. Yikes. That's pretty bad. But the mm-hmm. South never makes that argument. They want their action to be a legitimate, super consistent with democracy, sort of peaceful political mm-hmm. thing. And Lincoln mm-hmm. says, uh, 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 that's what this is about. We don't get this right. Emancipation is, I mean, that is way down on the list. You have got to figure out that this is how free people rule themselves. And if you're not willing to do this, any talk of emancipation is just, mm-hmm. you know, um, a waste of time. Yeah, I think that's well said. I know we probably want to get to the questions. I'll just very quickly piggyback on that. One of the most fascinating things about Lincoln's arguments in 61 is just putting it on the table and asking in the South, show me in particular, let's for the sake of argument say secession is legitimate, which it's not. Yeah. But let's for the sake of argument say that it is, show me what constitutional right has been violated. And I often put that question to my, my students, and they often struggle to have an answer other than our interests, our interests as we understand them with mm. regard to slavery not being protected. But right. to suggest that there is a constitutional right that's been violated, that's a hard road to hoe. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, very, very good. Um, I know that in, in working with, um, with teachers, middle school and public school, um, middle school and high school social studies teachers who want to incorporate more original primary documents into their, their curricula, um, some of them right, may, may struggle when it comes to, I don't know, how do I incorporate Lincoln's Fourth of July speech into, right, into my lesson plans when this, right, it's so long, how much do I give my students? What do mm-hmm. we focus on? This document to me seems to maybe, you know, answer that question or fill that void, that this is sort of the perfect original document to, to give your students in high school and middle school um, to not just, you know, use documents more in your classrooms, but also maybe to, to introduce them to, to Lincoln's political thought and, and the Civil War through the words of those who, who lived and wrote it. Um, and I say this knowing, you know, having spoken to teachers who say, you know, when I give my students this document, um, the students get it. I mean, mm. this conversation was wonderful and, 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 and very, very deep. But, right, students, right, even at high school or middle school level can read this, this, this fragments or note, whatever you want to call it, of Lincoln's. And they, they see something of what Lincoln is talking about here. And Lincoln, Lincoln speaks to them. I, I think this is a document that we should be using more in our classroom. So I guess my, my final question to you guys, since I see that we're down to our final two minutes here, uh, can each one of you take you know, maybe you know, a minute or so to give me your best argument for why teachers should include this particular document in their, uh, in their classrooms? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. I, I think you've really hit the nail on the head, actually. I think it's brevity rather than being a vice is a great virtue of peace like this. Um, I think that to the extent that you can show students in sitting down with short passages and having a conversation where you really do have the luxury of almost going line by line in a reading, which we often really don't have that opportunity with students, to really sit down and mull over together a text like this. First and foremost, before you even say anything about getting at Lincoln's spot, just encouraging those kinds of habits that part of what we're doing is sitting uh, in many respects, as as um, sort of uh, common folks with a lot in common, we think that there is something that has to be learned or gleaned from this document. We can do that literally through conversation. I think mm-hmm. it encourages a Socratic conversation. It encourages um, a certain amount of depth that you often don't get to have when you're merely teaching from textbooks, frankly, if I'm being honest. And so I think just the habit of sitting down with a short piece and reading it together, frankly, as friends, even though I know, and depending on our situation, that relationship might be very different. But uh, sitting down as people who want to learn something from this text, those are good habits. 
as far as with regard to Lincoln, I think uh, you hit the nail right on the head, Jason. Um, the idea that you are getting in some ways in shorthand what it's taken people like me and Lucas a long time to go through with longer documents <laughs> to all these points of contact, but in brief in the beginnings of an argument of seeing how to speak of self-government, to speak of political institutions, and really to speak of the Constitution and Union um, presupposes an argument about um, equality and liberty and presupposes mm -hmm. a moral philosophical argument. And I think if you mm -hmm. can show students here that at the end of the day, ideas really did and really do matter, um, this is one of those documents that helps you do that. Yes. Yeah, we've got less than a minute, and I echo everything that Jason just said, um, agree with it in toto. I would just add, and it, it, it derives from what he just said, is that um, uh, we can't, as citizens, afford not to be able to pay attention to arguments. We ha if we are going to be a deliberative democracy, a democracy that doesn't just, a republic that doesn't just say, once we're in power, our will is the way and the minority has to take it, um, that's, it, it seems like our, our parties today, uh, a pox on both houses, right? It seems like it's, it's all about, I mean, why, what was the Kavanaugh hearing about? What was Gorsuch about? What is Trump about? It's all about, man, it's, if our guy isn't in, woe is us. And if we get in, ha ha, now we rule. Um, we have got to get back to the place where we can see what's common, uh, that what we share, and, and to promote civic uh, trust, I think, um, will require that we listen. And what will that require? Patience and being able to attend carefully to what is said by somebody else and the easiest way, the most careful way to do it is by reading, reading what's put down on paper where if you don't understand something, you can go back and reread, look up a word uh, and try to figure it out. Probably, I mean, what is this? Apples of gold and pictures of silver. What declaration? What part of the declaration? He has liberty to all in quotes. Is that a quote from somewhere? I'd argue it's not. It's a paraphrase. Anyway, but it teaches kids to slow down. Mm. It teaches them to work uh, to try to figure something out. That's cogitation. We're not just doing impulsive things. Um, and so I think for all those reasons, it, it, it makes for good citizens. Um, that, that, uh, agree, you know, that's, that's the gift that keeps giving for me. Wonderful. I can't think of a better way to, to wrap things up than that. So I'll just, uh, you know, end things here now by saying thank you to, to both of our panelists, as well as to our participants for some really great uh, questions. As a reminder, you'll be uh, receiving an email within the next week that will include a link for a certificate of participation. It will also contain a link to the archive webinar, which we hope you will share with your colleagues as well as on social media. Uh, if you've enjoyed today's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course in our MAG program, our Masters of American History and Government program. You can find more information about online course offerings as well as many other resources for teachers at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org. Our next Documents in Detail webinar will take place on Wednesday, February 19th. So mark your calendars when our topic will be Plessy versus Ferguson. We look forward to seeing you back here on February 19th where we'll be joined with a couple of more outstanding scholars. Uh, gentlemen, Dr. Morell, Dr. Jividen, thank you for the, the pleasure of your company and a terrific conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you very done. Yeah, it was Thanks again for listening. Remember that you can find information about all of our programs online and in person at tah.org. If you look in the upper right-hand corner of the home screen, you'll see a, uh, a link to our seminars where you can find out information about our live free seminars for teachers of American history, government, and civics that we're holding in about 25 states at this point. And also under the programs link on at the top of that homepage, you can find information about both our webinar series, Documents in Detail, and this year's Saturday webinar series, American Minds. Our next Documents in Detail webinar, as Dr. Stevens said, is on the 19th of February of this year and will be on Plessy v. Ferguson. Thanks so much.